100 episodes and what feels sometimes like 100 years ago, we did our very first episode in Paris. It's time, I guess, to go back. <laughs> this is the future. I like it. I'm Anthony Bourdain. I write, I travel, I eat, and I'm hungry for more. There's something going on in Paris. Strange and wonderful rumblings of a bold new direction. That's what they're saying anyway. This is my friend, Eric Dupin. He's French. Maybe you know him from such three-star Michelin, four New York Times-starred restaurants as Le Bernardin in New York City, and from such television shows as this one. Eric started his career here in Paris, working at the famous Le Tour d'Argent, and then later, for perhaps the greatest chef of the last hundred years, the man they call the chef of the century, Joël Robuchon. <laughs> It's been a while since Eric spent any serious time eating in Paris, and he has every reason to believe he knows his way around here. The expensive places were Maxime's and La Tour d'Argent and La Serre, and they were formal and so on. But things have changed since Eric's time. A new breed, not necessarily a movement, not any kind of an organized thing, but a groundswell, a rising of young Turks, reactionaries, revolutionaries, people for whom the old way, what they used to call the correct way, the way the old Michelin star system used to demand it had to be done, is the enemy. This is a small specialty shop, La Tête dans les Olives, specializing in olives and other homemade goodies. For Alexandre Kama, writer and founder of The Fooding Guide, and chef Inaki Espitar have agreed to meet us. So, what's going on in Paris? A lot of people doing exciting things at the same time, or is this an organized movement? The problem, I think, of the cuisine française is that at a moment, when we are among the best or the best country, or the one where there was the best soil and all that, we had a tendency to sophisticate enormously. And at a moment, we finished by being found in a situation with des chefs, des guides, des écoles hôtelières, who were content simply to reproduce la tradition française et qui oubliait finalement d'être français. It sounds as if it were a reactionary tendency that a lot of people just decide I, I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. I think that Inaki is completely French and he's building the new traditions. Et je pense que le, le, le changement il vient de, surtout de la clientèle. Parce que c'est surtout les gens aussi qui, oui. qui en ont assez de, des cadres de, de, temple, euh, ouais, de ces cadres pro de pro et ces serviteurs un peu coincés quoi. The fooding guide was provocative to say the least. We create le fooding because we, we were very shame about this very serious way of talking about cook in France and of style of restaurants. Was there some resistance from the traditional uh, food yeah. press, I would guess? Yes. Uh, of course. Yeah. So what does this mean to the future of, of dining? Can fine dining and this more casual democratic uh, of, of cuisine, can they coexist? I have something to say. Yeah. Um, I I don't don't Two things to say. The first thing is the idea of the Michelin I thought was very ingenious at the time. It was meant to help tourism in regions. So because a chef will get a three star, only tourism will come into a region. Now, an analogy that I have made a couple of times with you, Tony. Mm -hmm. You can very well go see a rock concert. Okay, I, I use the example of you too. Mm -hmm. But you can always decide to go to the opera. And you can be the same person. So you don't have to be black and white so much. For restaurants, I think it's the same. Now, in defense of the, of the Michelin, if I may, I'm talking with someone who gets who has the weight of the stars on, on his shoulder. This is like pop music versus classic music. But I think and if, you're, if, you're young, if you're young and you're starting a new band, it is important to attack you too. I think that you're obligated almost to attack the system if, uh, now, if, if you're starting up. It doesn't matter if Michelin exists or not. I have, I have a vision. At Le Bernardin, we say, the fish is the star of the plate. Whatever we do is to elevate the fish. This is a significant moment, I think, because for the first time I've ever seen, Eric has found himself in the position of having to defend fine dining, poor bastard. Um, it's not All afternoon, he's having to defend himself as well for the sin of running one of the best restaurants in the world. A troubling harbinger of things to come? Isolated incident? A sign of the apocalypse? What does this mean? 
In the meantime, maybe finding solace in the old school seems suddenly like a very good idea. Comfort food to comfort troubled souls. Vatorat Weepery, run by generations of the Vatorat family. Eric has some history with this butcher shop. Oh, nice. Monsieur Vadoran, his father before him, supplied and continued to supply the very best tripes, kidneys, livers, and other back-end bits to some of the best restaurants in Paris, including the estimable Joel Robuchon. Yes, if you want to go eat tripes. He's not serving cooked tripe or kidneys as it's late spring, but not to worry, he insists. He knows somebody, a client nearby. Okay. Okay. He'll have this man show us over there and make sure we're properly looked after. But he has all the offers that you can imagine. Right. All of them. A few blocks over, a tiny family-run neighborhood joint who specialize, oh joy of joys, in traditional offal dishes. Uh, avec des champignons. Voilà. Un peu de à poivre. On va les faire flamber. Tirole. Le tirole avec de la crème. Et puis, oh, c'est cimenti. We sit down for a quick bowl of the tiniest, palest pink, sweetest little kidneys I've ever had. Cooked with Girol mushrooms and a split pepper. Perfection. What Paris was, and always has been, and hopefully always will be, great at. This is good. I'm coming back here. I like the kick. A little bit of the espelette. You know, it comes at the end. The sauce is good too, actually. Mm -hmm. I know they are exceptional. I have to say. And he was saying you have to cook them very quickly and they have to be pinkish. If not, you lose the flavor and you become like a rubbery. We did good. Now I'm strong. Now you're strong. I'm strong. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm going to come back here for the full thing, you know? Yeah. One chef, one seating, one price. Amazing. We are able to do food that you can serve in a very expensive restaurant because he has the knowledge and the talent. Everything is fine. Everything is fine. Nothing has changed. Classics still here. All good. Condition normal. Or is it? Lake Cocotte, owned by chef Christian Constant, of an earlier generation of great chefs who also opted to leave the Michelin stars behind and opt for more casual, friendly, neighborhood-oriented dining. And Cherry Marks, the fearsomely brilliant, forward-thinking new chef who's been exploring a new molecular style of gastronomy without any stabilizers or artificials. On the surface, two guys who are as different as can be. But what's going on in Paris with the astronomy, with this move towards more casual? What does it all mean? Je pense que à Paris, le, le bistrot a pris le pas un petit peu sur sur les étoilés. C'est mon point de vue personnel. Je travaille au Crayon, on avait des étoiles, hein? et, et euh, je me suis aperçu que les gens recherchent un petit peu la convivialité, la simplicité, euh, des plats traditionnels. My memories of France. It was like we were going to the table and we were spending hours and hours and hours. And they're saying that the tendency today is to be much faster. A little bit like what we do in, in, in the US or in New York, for instance. But we, much, we don't spend three hours at the table. What a change. Can the two systems uh, coexist? Uh -huh. Le client, il a pris la liberté aujourd'hui. Donc il dit, si je veux manger un burger sur un corner, et le soir, dans un corner de le chat. Et je veux que personne n'ait la vie là-dessus. They don't want anyone to tell them what to do. And my observation was, well, that has been done in the US already a long time ago. We have been pioneers in that aspect. Ravioli with mousseron mushrooms. Ravioli de champignons, mousseron et foie gras. Ah, c'est ça, les mousserons. That's a magic mushroom. Mousseron is a tiny mushroom with so much flavor. Just like the cuisine, the taste in wine seems to be changing uh, as well. On voit beaucoup maintenant de, de vin qui est, qui est fait d'une façon un peu différente que, le, que la façon plutôt classique de faire le, le comme, on a, comme moi j'ai connu. Aujourd'hui, on consomme les vins plus rapidement. On ne considère plus qu'il faut acheter des vins pour collectionner. And a big question that's pretty much unavoidable these days. So what do you think of the cork versus screw? Is the connection to the cork entirely emotional at this point? Uh, me, I believe, I believe the cork is important. <laughs> Why am I asking you? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm for the cork. I don't, first of all, I don't like the experience. No, no, I'm asking you if it's emotional. 
Is there a flavor difference? I feel bad for you on this show, I really do. <laughs> You're constantly finding yourself in the position of defending the old way. It's just not right. You know what I'm discovering? I'm old. <laughs> I didn't realize how old I was until, until this touchy power is a revelation. Marche pour le bouchon. Now, here's the real difference. The difference is, is, is you're less likely to get laid after dinner if, if your wine is a scoot top. Surtout en France. Where are we? Ass end of nowhere, best I could tell. A narrow, one-way cobblestone street and what's the name of this neighborhood? And here we are, Frenchie where we get one of our first looks at what might be the future. I love this place already because, you know, look at it. It looks like it's going to be good. This is the future. I like it. Because it's vegetables, too. <laughs> Gregory Marchand is French. French-born, French-trained. But unlike most generations who came before, he spent 18 months early in his career in New York at Gramercy Tavern. He talks about Brooklyn style a lot. The name David Chang comes up. Now try to imagine a French chef 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, talking admiringly about an American chef. Now, what's going on here? One menu, prefix. One seating for a couple dozen people. One guy cooking. Menu changes every day with the market. This was not the way fine dining was supposed to be, right? Or wrong? 25 euros. Appetizamentos desserts. Smoked mackerel with asperge sauvage, wild asparagus. It's amazing how guys who have luncheonette wants to do IN sometimes. The guys from the IN want to do the contrary. It's beautiful. Oh, the smell is great too. Yeah. And one of my favorite underutilized fish. Pretty. Mm. I like the texture. Unnerving. This is no way to get rich in the restaurant business, but this guy doesn't seem to care. It's remarkable the complete lack of greed. I'll make just this much money. That's just what I mean. That's enough. I don't need to get rich. But it's interesting that the guy is so passionate. He thinks about, okay, I'm investing in quality of products, not in making my life easy mm -hmm. and having another cook. I don't care about that. I'm strong enough. I'm young enough. I'm thinking about giving the best to my client in terms of ingredients for the price. Yeah, I never thought that way my whole life. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> it's why I ended up with Charlie A. Cook. <laughs> They filled me with terror. Ooh, that was good. Beets, raspberries, hazelnuts, and then ventreche, which is like a pork belly. Right. I can't imagine how this is going to taste, actually. I, can't, I mean, I'm looking at the components and I'm... Mm. The beets and the raspberries? Mm -hmm. They really go well together. I wouldn't have thought so, but... Oh, me too. Cake with a ragu of spring vegetables. Impeccable. Oh, yes. It's really pretty. Yeah. It's refined. The food is very refined. They are able to do food that you can serve in a very expensive restaurant. Because he has the knowledge and the talent. A sirloin of beef prepared with lardo and served on a base of pureed black rice. Oh. Ah, yeah. So what is it exactly? It's black rice or red rice, ah. pureed. Pureed? Yeah. Interesting. I've never seen it before. This is really a great idea. Eric's thinking about what this might mean for the future. Me, I'm thinking, as I tend to do after a couple of glasses of good wine, about the afterlife. I was considering making a mean crack about Tyler Florence and asked Eric, a practicing Buddhist, what this might mean for my quality of afterlife. I'm a good person. I never doubted about that. I don't think my karma is going to be so... I'm really, yeah. I'm like, what do you think? Am I doomed? What do you think I got to do to catch up? Oh, I don't like that expression. Can't you pay in advance? No. <laughs> Tony, live your life, enjoy the moment, forget about the cow. <laughs> I'll be refilling the salad bar at TGI Fridays for like a million years. Oh, it won't be like that. I'll be like, more bacon bits, sir. <laughs> it's going to be more interesting. <laughs> oh, man. So that's sort of the best case scenario. <laughs> Next up, sharing an old favorite with Eric and his mentor. Ah, look at that. See, that's so nice. <laughs> no reservations. Back to the slightly more familiar seems the right way to go. I thought butcher's breakfast. 
neighborhood butcher Hugo Desnoyers showed us around his fantastic butcher shop, the kind that used to be more common back in the day, where everybody knows your name, what you like, where they make their own sausages and charcuterie and pâté, where the butchers know exactly what best to do with whatever you might buy and how to cook it. So this is the missing ingredient, even in really good American butcher shops. They don't do this. You either cut meat or you do this. You don't do both. But of course it makes sense, right? Yeah. This is like Disneyland to me. Less so to Eric, I'm guessing, where this kind of thing is a birthright. But he deserves a soft landing this morning and a healthy breakfast after getting his ass gnawed on by a bunch of angry young Robespierre's. Okay. Breakfast is with Hugo at the joint next door, the Jeu de Quille, where the owner and chef's business model is very much in keeping with what we've been seeing lately from the moderns. Menu changes daily, based entirely on what's around and what's good. Today, freshly laid organic eggs, prosciutto, fresh sausage, and pata negra, the finest Iberian ham. Uh, what time do you start to work uh, in the morning? It depends on the day, but uh, this morning at 5 o'clock. So this is lunch. Oh yeah, this time I'm hungry. <laughs> of course, this being Paris, no better time for a nice bottle, and I mean a very nice bottle of white wine. Ah, but excuse me, pardon, pardon. This is the way to live. I can see the yolk. Yeah. It's orange. It's so easy to forget what an egg tastes like. Simple things like a, like a really good egg, really, really good ham. Pork that tastes like pork. Exactly. I haven't eaten ham like that, I think, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, yes. Thank you, Lord. Sweetbreads, one of my favorite things, the carefully sautéed thymus gland of a young calf. A handful of chanterelle mushrooms, some wild asparagus, sautéed in wonderful, wonderful butter. Mmm, glandy. Ooh, voila. Nice. This is exciting. Tout simple, n'est-ce pas? C'est ça. Beautiful. Oh, hello. It's delicious. In France, we have the best villain in the world. Yeah. Paris has become exactly the opposite of its reputation. People assume, including me, that it's expensive to eat here. That if you're going to eat well here, it's going to be ridiculously expensive. But there are clearly a lot of options now where you can eat really good food and exciting new food for yes, cheap and totally, totally reasonable. I'm a little sad. I feel I've misspent my life. I should have been here. Paris? Well, you know what I mean. I'm standing there watching people in front of the butcher shop walk by. They shake hands with the butcher. Hey, how you doing? You go... You know, I don't live in a world like that, where everybody knows the butcher's name, and you, you go into the restaurant, a little shop every day, and say, gee, what's, what do you have? Oh, today we have burrata, and oh, these beautiful tomatoes just came in. Well, look what we have to do to get those tomatoes. You, you got to fight your way through a bunch of nasty yeah, grandmothers, and you got to elbow some old lady in the face. <laughs> then, off to Paris's original open-air street market, Rue Mouffetard. This is still, as much as you can find it anywhere, the Paris of Emile Zola. The sagging roofs, the old buildings, the merchants in the streets. And I know Eric has been nervous about this, making television with his mentor, Joël Robuchon. Hell, anybody would be nervous. He's probably the most important chef of the last hundred years. He's a man with a reputation for being uncompromising, demanding of the very best. Tu sais qu'à l'époque, c'était dans, dans la rue que, comment elle s'appelle, Edith Piaf chantait ici. Ah ben c'est un des plus vieux marchés, hein, c'est le vieux Paris, hein, c'est sûrement hein, euh, au premier siècle. Ça existait, hein, c'est un des premiers marchés parisiens, ça. Is it still possible to get good products in France as it was 20, 30 years ago? Yeah, there's always a nostalgia. nostalgia. He says it's a nostalgia about the past and people saying in the past it was better, but he doesn't believe so. He says today it's, it's much, much easier to, to find quality than, than 30 years ago. Small producers? Yes, small producers again, yes. But today goes swimming. Like I said, I'm nervous too, but we're lucky enough to have picked this place out for our lunch, Le Papillon. About as simple as it gets. Mais ça n'existe pas des marchés comme ça à New York, si. Pas vraiment. Donc c'est extraordinaire quand même. En fait, quand on commande les huîtres, et c'est le poissonnier d'à côté qui les apporte. On commande le fromage, c'est le fromager d'à côté qui les apporte. You gotta love that. I love the idea. À la vôtre, Tony. À la vôtre, Tony. They're beautiful, hein? Elles sont belles. You were miles ahead, years and years ahead of everybody else uh, with uh, the atelier uh, concept. What was the inspiration for this idea? Alors j'ai voulu créer un concept que ce soit le concept lui-même qui amène l'ambiance. Moi je vis en Espagne, hein, j'adore l'Espagne et c'est vrai que quand vous allez dans les bars à tapas, il y a toujours l'ambiance dans les bars à tapas. C'est peut-être un des rest... enfin c'est un des concepts de restauration peut-être un des plus conviviaux que je connaisse. But where I got lucky in the Please Make Robuchon Like Me department, where I blundered in a greatness and his good grace.
races was by simply ordering an old favorite, an all too rare, even in France dish called pied paquet, a tripe and pigfoot thing I learned to love at Layout. The fact that I, an American, would order such a thing comes apparently as a surprise. Yeah, Papa? Ah, look at that. See, that's so nice. Oh, moi j'aime bien les tripes. Moi j'aime bien, pied paquet, c'est bon, hein? J'aime bien. Est-ce que vous pouvez recommander des pieds paquets aux Américains quand ils viennent à Paris? You can recommend to Americans who come to Paris to find pieds paquets. Oh, I will. It, uh, it's important to spread enlightenment. Yes, yes, yes. Here's the thing about Robuchon. You could, I guess, call him old guard. But it was Robuchon who, way ahead of everybody else, pioneered the new direction that everybody seems to be following these days. While his contemporaries were still building haute cuisine versions of the mummy's tomb, he went his own way, with a revolutionary breakthrough that changed fine dining and how we eat today forever. Coming up, we see if Anaki Espitar is all they say he is. This has some genius in it. Yeah. All in all, Eric seems to be having a good time. Sure, he's taken a few shots of the young'uns. But the meeting with his mentor went well. Robuchon has even invited us to L'Atelier later in the week. So life is good. The engine turns up. Oh, I get it. It sounds like it dies and then you just step on the gas again and it starts up. To save the planet sort of thing. How long were you at Trudeau, John? Almost two years. That must have been great, because you're seeing dishes there that you know, you'll never see again. Out of the duck. Hey, that dish is coming back, man. Big time, right? Yeah, I'm telling you. I never thought I would find myself in this bizarre position. There you are, you're sitting at a table, having to defend yourself for running a three-star Michelin restaurant. Seriously, you don't run a three-star restaurant to screw the people. You but, do that by passion, and you do that because you want people to be happy, right? But, but this is what happened. It was, it was interesting. I was surprised. The Chateaubriand looks like, well, a pub. A noisy, minimally decorated pub or, or wine bar. Time to see if this Inaki guy is the hot shot that the foodie dude seems to think he is. Not formally trained and personally, along with only a couple of other cooks manning the ridiculously tiny kitchen, Inaki Espitar has a single prefix menu a day. I'm not sure what it means. I'm a little scared. It means the world is changing and uh, uh, a young generation doesn't uh, see uh, what we do maybe with the same reverence. It is true that you can eat great food in bistros that sometimes is as good as a three star. And I love the idea that all these people who can't afford to cuisine are now able to eat this well for that cheap. That's good too. That's the good news. That's fantastic. But, but it really was like painting a young Trotsky. Yes. It could be our head on the pike. Well, not me. You're... <laughs> <laughs> Small and loose bush. No, no, that's beautiful. Carpaccio, I mean, I, I think it's beef with uh, fresh fathers and fresh beef and, and anchovies. It's really good flavor. It's really good. A rouge dish. That's like a small red mullet of truly extraordinary freshness and quality. Yeah. Yeah. So what I understood before is that he's using the liver of the, the rouge, which is a red mullet, right. and also real liver, maybe chicken liver or something. Uh -huh. The rouge, the quality of it is amazing. Good carrot. Uh huh. Vegetables really taste different in your Yeah. I cannot explain why. What's wrong with us? I mean, you know, we're, we're the new world. We're the land of, of, of everything. Why? Not enough dead Romans in the soil? <laughs> and then this, this thing. A nearly all-white dish of white sea bream with white asparagus, mascarpone cheese, and brown butter. And it's amazing. It's devastating. I don't want to embarrass my friend, but I swear I saw the Ripper's eyes filled with what looked like tears there for a brief second. You know what I really like about this plate right off? It's all white. That's really cool. It's using flowers of a tree called Suro. What is it? Elder, Elder flower. Elder, Elder flower. flower. Very cool. Whoa. This is shockingly good. This is an experience. Yeah. And then see how juicy is the fish and flavorful. Is that mascarpone cheese? Yeah. I mean, that shouldn't work, but it and really does. Mascarpone, white asparagus, on the verge of being raw, but the texture. Ah, the guy has talent. This is a really amazing dish. This has some genius in it. Yeah. Okay. And when you can come up with a dish like that, you celebrate. Yeah, I was lucky enough to discover that once in my life, I'd never take it off the menu. No, never. I mean, I wish I could have invented a dish like that. This seemingly austere bowl of fresh almonds and mosh dropped between courses was also deceptively awesome. Eric was talking about this one days later, too. 
the salmons and mash. This is clearly making you happy. This is what we like about dining. Fine or not fine dining. Right. It's to be surprised if you have an experience. And that's hard to do to us. Come on. It's... I mean, this is fine cuisine. The way it's cooking is really, really upscale. It has nothing to do with bistro food. I would have been really, really happy with so much less. Yeah. You know what I mean? This is way better than I expected. This is an amazing cuisine. I mean, the guy is like a great chef. He's using a very organic way of cooking. I haven't seen anything inspired by super modern cuisine like molecular or whatever you call it. In order to be a true revolutionary, you have to be willing to completely destroy the old. I don't think any of these guys is interested in doing that. I, I think they clearly love the old. Yes. One of the great meals of memory. Yeah, me too. Next, more of the best that Paris has to offer. Oh, look at that. Oh, well, wow. Come to daddy. Oh, Lord, that's good. Reservation in Paris, they say, is not at some ultra-expensive temple of gastronomy. It's at this place, Le Comptoir, what Eric has called the perfect bistro. Sadly, my partner in crime is unavailable. He's off on some sort of super-secret Buddhist thing, I think. I do know that I gotta do Le Comptoir thing myself. Eric can't network me a reservation, but maybe this guy can. Frederic Kahn runs what looks like an old-school wine shop. And he looks like an old-school wine guy. He's also very good friends with the elusive chef-owner of Le Comptoir, Yves Camdebourg. Like so many of the other chefs we're meeting on this trip, Camdebourg used to run a more haute cuisine kitchen, but after 12 years decided he'd had enough and wanted to open a more casual place. Why have you chosen this path? C'est parce que euh, moi je suis consommateur déjà, c'est très important. Et il n'existait pas de, de lieu qui ressemble à la dans le sens où en général quand on voulait bien manger, on était obligé d'aller dans les grands gastronomiques. Là, c'était surtout dans une ambiance de, comme je, moi j'appelle ça, de l'ambiance de musée. C'est-à-dire que, voilà, c'est-à-dire qu'il y a des codes, il y a des comportements à avoir. On ne veut pas être soi-même. On n'est jamais soi-même. On n'est pas à l'aise. This is a very affordable restaurant, le comptoir. How important is that? Parce que pour moi, c'est important parce que c'est. Je, je pense que bien manger, ça ne doit pas être réservé à une élite. On peut être un bon restaurateur, un bon cuisinier, sans être Michel. Later that night, reservation secured, I arrive early. Too early. But no problem. Good thing, actually, because right next door, there's L'Avant Comptoir. That means before Le Comptoir, by the way. And I jam myself in there with a bunch of other people who are getting loose before they sit down for dinner or waiting for a table. It's just like munching on small plates of some tasty, tasty... Notice the communal bread and stick of butter. Just squeeze in and grab and smear. Oh, man, that butter's over the top. Order up some cured meat. I can't tell you how happy making this is. You know this place is going to be good because next door, their little uh, L'Avant Comptoir, their logo is the pig. It's like a secret sign. Frederick says he'll swing by as soon as he can, but I rip right into my knee. Oh, nice. A little amused bouche of foie gras. Oh, Lord, that's good. Then, crab, flying fish eggs, and spring vegetables in a foie gras gelée. Ah, merci. That's pretty. Mmm. Wow. I'm sorry. Both, I think. Then a ravioli of blood sausage with a split-infused broth that is one of the best things I've tasted all year. Oh, oh look at that. Oh, it's bleeding in. Mm. Oh, yeah. I'm such a slut for blood sausage. Come to me, my love. It's ridiculously good. Frederick tells me that as well as the evening prefix, this place also has a simple bistro menu during the day. And he comes pretty much daily for one thing in particular. Yes. Which, by the way, is deviled eggs. We do the best of mayonnaise of the world. Roasted veal loin with salted butter, sautéed chanterelle, shallots, and chives with an almond and rhubarb jus. I like my friend. It's a good man. Yeah, really. I hope this is the future. I hope too. We have to eat simple, fresh product. In fact, it's the top, at the top for me. That's a picnic. I agree. My strongest memories of my father were 
we, we would come to, to France. We would eat in good restaurants. We would eat around. But my father was happiest. We would go to uh, the beach, uh, and we would go for a picnic. And we would bring some good uh, saucisson, some good uh, cheese, some some wine, vin, ordinaire. And this was when my father was happiest. Well, I would look at his face, and he was like this. And he would always say the same thing. He would say, uh, I am a man of simple needs. Th this was perfect for him. Oh, wow. It's absolutely perfect product, impeccably prepared, impeccably presented. Super. Oh, man. And of course, I, the cheese plate. Right? Okay. If there's any question of the enduring glory of France, meaning why France should remain a world power forever, it's this. Look at this. I hope this is all for us because... Uh, I get a chance at the end to thank Eve in person. Chef, super. Quel joie. <laughs> what a joy, what a pleasure. And finally, the master shows everyone how it's done. You can smell it. It's going to be fantastic. Cook to perfection, too. Look at that. Perfection. Done things in my life. Okay, I haven't walked on the moon, but I've seen and been witness to some extraordinary things. But on the day I get hit by an ice cream truck and dragged up into the wheel well as I lay there in the sleep bleeding out, I will remember the day I ate at L'Atelier de Jean Robuchon with Joel Robuchon standing in front of me, personally supervising each dish. Understand this. Les Ateliers de Joël Robuchon are more casual in dining style, but the food coming over that bar, as good as anything anywhere. You're spending your money on food, not on 20 damn waiters and floral arrangements. It's fine dining, the finest, without the pain or the attitude. And damn, it's made fine dining fun again. We started with Robuchon's gazpacho. Gazpacho, c'est ça? The finesse? Yes. It's so harmonious. That is his style. Like to create like a very harmonious combination all the time. The new wave of young guys working alone in their kitchens, are they any different than that he was as a young man? He said that it's great that a lot of young people are going into the business without being necessarily trained and, and learning the basics. Out of those people, the majority at one point is going to be blocked because the lack of the training that you need to do cooking at this level. What he has seen in his career, it's a lot of people who are so passionate. At one point, they decided to learn the basics, even at an older age. And he saw them even in his kitchen, and some of them even went further. However, he believes that really at the end of the day, you should start at a young age to have the right training, and then you will be able to go much further because it's going to be a minority succeeding. Sole Meunier, as classic as it gets. Classic to the point that few people do it right anymore. A beautiful Dover sole, pan-fried on the bone in butter, and served with brown butter and a little lemon. Trust me, this is a forgotten art. A, you can smell it. It's going it's to be fantastic. It's cooked to perfection, too. Look at that. Perfection. Mais il tremble pas, hein? Ouais, ouais. <laughs> no checking, hein? Huh? Well, it wasn't before. <laughs> Merci. Oh, beautiful. Mm. C'est vraiment fabuleux. And the famous, the notorious Robuchon mashed potatoes. Oh, good. I would have been very upset if I didn't get this. I mean, look at this. Voilà. What percentage of, of these potatoes are butter? 1 kg of butter, 250 grams of butter. Voilà. It's your last day. You know you're going to die. Your last one to mouth. What's that? If you wanted another product, you know, a good pomme de terre, I'm going to take a good pomme de terre with a piece of butter. I'm happy. 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 But in Paris, 99 shows after our very first one, it seems a fair question. A lot of what we were wary about Paris seems to have disappeared or be disappearing. The attitude, the hidebound ways, the sense that you must do this, like this, you cannot do that, it is not French. 
That way of thinking seems to be on its way out. But the real question is not what I've learned in Paris. I don't have the burden of Michelin stars, a world-renowned restaurant to live up to. What does Eric take from this is what I'm curious to see. What has he seen after revisiting his past and looking into a possible future? And how does he process that back home?